Welcome to the Risk and Repeat podcast, episode number 231. I'm Rob Wright, Security News Director at Tech Target, and I am here with Senior Security News Writer Alex Kalafi. Alex, welcome. Thanks, Rob. How are you doing on this fine Wednesday morning? Oh, good. It's a normal security summer, which means a lot of smaller, weirder stories uh, compared to the spring and fall. I don't know. Is that usually your impression? Yeah, sometimes uh, we're in the period now where things start to slow down a little and get into, uh, you know, the summer months and then you have Black Hat and DEF CON and then, you know. Who knows what happens when, well, we do know what happens when school classes resume in the fall. It's Mm -hmm. typically a lot of ransomware attacks and data theft and extortion and, or a combination of both. So uh, yeah, it is a bit slower, but there's been some big news, interesting developments in this topic over the last few days. And we're talking about none other than Snowflake. Mm-hmm. Uh, Snowflake has come under fire over approximately the last week. And like I said, interesting developments along the way with this story. So we figured it would be a good topic to take a look at because it touches on a lot of things that we have written about, and we have covered authentication issues, MFA, uh, data in the cloud with third party providers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Alex, you wrote but, but both stories, I should mm-hmm. be right, both stories uh, that we've written thus far on this topic. So why don't you take it from the top and tell us how this started and kind of where we're at at this point? Sure. So, so all this started at the tail end of May uh, regarding Snowflake, which is a pretty big uh, cloud-focused storage analytic database type vendor. Um, one of those companies that like, you don't always hear about in in our line of work, but they are one of the uh, bigger players in the storage analytics database sort of space. Um, a, another vendor, Mitiga, security vendor, um, sort of called attention to a threat actor dubbed UNC5537, which had been uh, committing data extortion style attacks, stealing data, attempting to extort victims with said data um, that are Snowflake database customers. Um, And they were doing this through stolen credentials. And so at the time, we didn't really know a lot. Snowflake sort of told us via a disclosure that it made at the time this, this Mitiga research came out that um, it didn't seem like there was a vulnerability or a uh, an attack against Snowflake's platform or any sort of breach against Snowflake itself proper. That was sort of their observation at the time. And then maybe two or three days later, I think it was June 1st, they came out alongside CrowdStrike and Google Cloud's Mandiant. CrowdStrike and Mandiant, very big players in the incident response space, and presumably Snowflake was working with both of them, and they jointly said that uh, there didn't seem to be any vulnerability, there was no evidence of vulnerability, there was no evidence that its platform was breached, and that it seemed to be a mostly limited instance of customers with single factor authentication. Mm-hmm. So that's that's generally passwords only. Um, getting attacked through stolen credentials and the credentials were stolen either from the purchased presumably on like a dark web market sort of situation or through info stealers. But the reason why this is all extra weird is that another vendor, Threat Intelligence One, called Hudson Rock, maybe, uh, I think it was May 31st. Uh, I, think um, it was so... June, I think it was June 1st. It was the day after the Mitiga report. Okay, so, so well, I think the Mitiga report was maybe the 30th. Oh, yep. And then we covered it the 31st, but then the Snowflake thing happened, yep. or the, the Hudson Rock the, thing happened on the yep. 30th. And at the time... This vendor was saying, actually, Snowflake was breached. 
um, and they called it like a massive breach. Mm-hmm. They said that uh, the the author of this piece, which has been taken down, said that they had been in contact with um, a threat actor on Telegram who said that uh, they attacked Snowflake and that all of these other customers, Ticketmaster, um, and I'm trying to think of what the other... Sun Thunder Bank. Sun, bunch yep. of, yeah, a bunch yep. of others. A, yep. Hundreds of others, which, actually, yeah. Which, which were named at the same time. Um were also compromised because of the snowflake breach suggesting that it could have been some sort of huge supply chain attack, which which became doubly confusing because um Ticketmaster is actually going through its own breach disclosure process right now, which makes it messier. Um and the uh, Snowflake basically had to come out and say this report is inaccurate. Um the report has been taken down and they came out alongside Mandiant and CrowdStrike to say there was this employee, this former employee, who had a demo account compromise, but there was there's no evidence that there was any supply chain thing, no evidence that there was uh, any sensitive data here, no evidence that a vulnerability was exploited, and no evidence that... Um, our platform is breached. Now, technically that still does leave a smidge of room for this supply chain attack thing to have occurred. But my read on it right now is that based on everyone's information that the Hudson rock report is not accurate. And that it seems like this is a very weird, uh, series of credential hacks. Is mm. that is that sort of a decent overview of what's what's going on? Yeah, although I guess w- maybe there is a smidge of room, but what would be the I guess the supply chain attack? Oh, I mean, I guess I, well, I get I get I get your point. I guess I'm thinking of like actual tampering with code. But if you get into the platform and the platform gives way to the customer. You know the the end yeah, user it, customer. I I get it. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. loosely defined supply. Yeah. I'm basically saying there's still room for all of this to go sideways, but it sure. seems like less and less room every day that passes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's a pretty good summary of where we're at. Um, they Snowflake is very adamant. It seems that that the Hudson Rock report was inaccurate. Uh, Hudson Rock put out a statement Monday. Uh, so mm-hmm. they took the they took the blog post down on Saturday, the same time that um, Snowflake issued the updated statement with CrowdStrike and Mandiant. So they took it down, and then two days later, after not commenting or explaining why they took it down, Hudson Rock tweeted something out that basically saying they received a legal letter asking for the article to be taken down and they did so kind of a messy situation so i or let's start here alex let's spin the wheel the big picture here we know that some of the customers like t- like you mentioned Ticketmaster has already disclosed um i think it was the 8k filing that they were breached through a third party um or that somebody had accessed a third party cloud resource or whatever. So we know that that's true. And we know, I, I guess there have been reports that other customers, potential customers of Snowflake have also had incidents. Um, so it seems like there were definitely attacks and there were definitely some Snowflake customers that were uh, that were compromised or at least had their databases compromised. What do you think happened? Are you like, when you saw the statement from, you know, the updated statement from Snowflake, co-signed by CrowdStrike and Mandiant. Um, what was your, what was your take? Were you like, well, that's, you know, this is just more sort of corporate speak, trying to minimize a potential security incident or CYA or whatever, or were you convinced, swayed by it? I'll give you, so I'll give you kind of a roundabout answer, which is something I've been thinking about with different stories. So 
Uh, I've been thinking a lot about how Microsoft has had a very weird security journey over yes. the last couple of years. Yes. How um, they weren't being very transparent. They were getting hit by breaches every single year. But then last fall, they sort of had this uh, this uh, secure future initiative, which they just updated where they promised they're going to prioritize security. Mm -hmm. But then there's this co-pilot stuff, which seems like that's going to be a security nightmare. So the thing I've sort of realized at this stage as, as a reporter, and this may be obvious, I don't know, is that the story is always moving. So for now, my opinion is, oh, looks like Hudson Rock was wrong. Maybe the threat actor they were talking to is lying. Maybe they, there was a misunderstanding. I don't know. This was a telegram chat. Yep. Right. Um, but tomorrow it could be that Snowflake was compromised, right? And that there was less wrong than they said. I mean, at the moment, it looks like if you're getting Mandiant and you're getting um, uh, CrowdStrike involved, then it maybe seems like there's there's more weight behind it to say this is a much smaller story than Hudson Rock made it out to be. and And if two giants in the sort of incident response space are, are co-signing it, then that gives a lot of credibility. However, the uh, the cynic in me, which you've helped foster over the last five years, is like, yeah, we'll see in two weeks if, if the story's <laughs> still like this. So that's sort of my roundabout way of saying, right now, seems like it's a smaller story than Hudson Rock made it seem. In two weeks, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to think. I don't know. How are you feeling about this? I want to circle back to your point on the cynicism and sort of the big picture on that in a second. Yeah. Uh, to me, when I guess I'll work backward. Uh, when I saw the statement over the weekend and I saw that it was jointly made with CrowdStrike and Mandiant, I... I was pretty convinced that they were correct. I don't see either of those two companies, which we have mentioned are, you know, the leaders in the incident response, big hack happens and you call in the big guns type cybersecurity companies. I mean, they're the two biggest um, for incident mm -hmm. response. Uh, when those two companies co-sign and say, we, we've looked at this and we've investigated and we don't think that a breach happened, uh, or that there's no evidence that a breach happened, then I'm inclined to go with that over the word of, and whatever evidence that a hacker provides. Mm -hmm. And not to get too into the weeds here with the the, the thought process on our end uh, and what we decided, or I guess ultimately I decided as as sort of the, the editor here, the, the news director, but you know that when I saw that Hudson Rock report, I I thought it was interesting, but we ultimately, I ultimately decided not to include that or or, or write about it at the time because th there is a number of reasons. And the, the biggest I, I agreed with you to be yeah. clear. <laughs> no, I I we we had a discussion about this. I mean, and I don't wanna this isn't to disparage Hudson Rock. It, or or anyone over there i've talked with uh, some folks over there in the past and we we've we've written about stuff that they've researched and reported so but number one so snowflake had already come out and said we think that this is just a, a case of where stolen credentials and are being used and they're signing into uh databases that lacked mfa um, we've seen that happen a lot lately. We've seen that happen a lot. Happened to Microsoft, you know, mm -hmm. in one of their big hacks recently. Somebody gets account credentials and they sign into something that does not have MFA and they're off to the races. Um, I thought that in light of that statement, the initial statement that Snowflake had made, um, compared to what the threat actor was saying, I was like, I, I don't really want to take the word of a threat actor. And I understand that they provided evidence. I understand that they had screenshots. 
It's very hard to verify screenshots. I know, I, I believe that they provided Hudson Rock researchers with a CSV file, but I mean, it's like, again, I, I don't, I don't know that that I'm not a forensic investigator, so I'm out of my element here, but just in conversations that I've had and, and people what I've, that I've spoken with over the years, it's still really hard to verify claims, even when they give you, you know, some files or, or you don't know where the files came from. You don't know if the files are, it, it's, it takes a lot of work to verify these claims. And I let me just also jump in for yeah. a second and say to what you're saying now and to what I was saying earlier about like cynicism and the story always moving. Um, you can trust a threat actor about as far as you can throw them, right? Which is not not, yeah. not very much at all. But the amount that I also trust, say, a government entity or a corporate entity, someone who's financially motivated. Um, is also far from one hundred percent. Yeah. So when when I when I do this, so basically, I know that you have to do the same math I do when you look at uh, the threat actor in this Hudson Rock piece, mm. um, and you look at, and I don't think the Hudson Rock author's lying. I just I think it's the threat actor who would be lying. Sure, most sure, likely. yeah, obviously. Um, so the the Hudson Rock threat actor, you sort of have to be like, okay, they're saying this. And then, okay, you have Mandiant, uh, CrowdStrike, and Snowflake saying this. I trust them more, but I still don't trust them, trust them completely. Like, so so it, it, yeah. it, it, it sort of ends up being like it's not a, a means of disrespect. Just we know that different people are motivated by different things. Sure. And anytime language can be used to possibly get someone out of a sticky situation later down the road, they'll possibly do that. So, so that's, that's all I was just going to add to your point is that it's, it's um, we sort of have to do like trust metrics and, and yeah. where you end up is like, I sort of trust that this is where things are at right now, but it could change. Yeah. There's it's like room a, for this to change. Yeah. It's like lowercase T trust, not a capital T. Uh, exactly exactly so and again i i just i'm very apprehensive about taking the word of threat actors regardless of of what they provide in the way of evidence and you know some way we've talked about this numerous times sometimes the threat actors are are just wrong like it's not that they're lying but they think they they accessed one thing and it turns out they're confused. They're in a completely different environment or a completely different customer or it, it, these things happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing that kind of gave me pause about the report was just there were aspects of, of the of the Hudson Rock blog post that turned me off a little. It seemed a little self-promotional in, in the chat, the discussion with the threat actor it just seemed a little it, it, it turned me off. And I sure I just. I know we had asked Snowflake about it. We asked Snowflake for comment. I, it's not that we were going to dismiss it completely, but I did not feel comfortable going ahead with it right away, specifically because it is saying in no uncertain terms that Snowflake suffered a massive breach, not the customers, and that those customers were compromised because of a single point of failure within, within Snowflake. And that's, that, is a, that is a huge huge allegation and i just think for something that big to make an accusation that big i think you, you've got to have more you, you need more evidence to make a claim that big now we saw that report like sp spread like wildfire i mean there are numerous stories there are still stories today that say that snowflake was breached and I kind of want to explore this for a minute because I don't, I'm not going to get into, you know, second guessing other media outlets or other cybersecurity vendors that are, I, I th that's not the exercise here because like we made our decision. I made my decision as editor on how to approach the story and how to treat the Hudson rock report and those claims. And, you know, people disagree. It's whatever. But to your point about the cynicism, I, 
like reading the reactions from a lot of people and respected mm -hmm. pe people that I, I, I know and have talked with and respect deeply. They've looked at that updated statement that Snowflake put out on Saturday with CrowdStrike and Mandiant and said, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. This is, this is just my interpretation of some of these responses, but they're kind of like, eh, that's just legal speak. That's just CYA. That that's that's carefully parsed lawyer language, and they could be trying to minimize it. They might have been mm -hmm. compromised, and they're just they're, you know, they're saying the platform wasn't breached. Well, what about some other part or so? And they're just like poking holes in it, and which was which that was a conversation we had too because I think yeah. in my second story I like I had wrote it that. Um, Snowflake said they didn't suffer a breach, and then you, as as the editor, were like, actually, um, they said their platform didn't suffer a breach, yep. which is a much smaller, it's a much more qualified thing to claim, and a much narrower thing to claim than the idea that no breach had occurred at and all. That's that is exactly one of the many things that folks had pointed out, and other folks were again, these people know. Like, like they've forgotten more about InfoSec than I will ever know. I'm not an investigator. I'm not a technical person. I'm just a journalist. Mm -hmm. But they're highlighting things like, oh, so an employee was compromised. You know, when was it like they say a former employee? Well, when was the what, like when did the employee leave? Like how did like if they were for, were they former at the time the credentials were compromised and used, et cetera, et cetera. Asking, I think, which are legitimate questions, mm -hmm. but a lot of people, it felt like we're using those those details and those questions and and turning it around to say, well, I don't really believe that this rules out the Hudson Rock report, which I found fascinating, and I I frankly disagree with, um, but I think I to, I see both ahead. points. I guess yeah. no, that that that's all. Is I just I there's technically some room for some version of that Hudson Rock report to exist, but it feels somewhat unlikely, I guess, yeah. at the moment. That's all. Well, do you think that this is, do you think we've arrived in this place where, I'm not saying we're taking the words of threat actors more than we're taking the words of victim organizations, because I don't think that's happening. But I do think that there's an interesting dynamic here, a shift. It and I wonder if we've arrived at this place because of things like, you know, you mentioned Microsoft, Alex, like breach, weird language, not a lot of transparency, this happened. And then you find out in the, you know, cyber safety, you know, uh, review board report. Oh, that actually didn't happen. And we, we tried Microsoft to get Microsoft to correct the public record and they wouldn't do it until X, Y, and Z. Do you think we've kind of arrived at this place where we have deep, skepticism and maybe even a little bit of cynicism about the official statements of vendors that suffer attacks or are dealing with incidents like this because of just a long track record and this is just the sort of the inevitable conclusion mm, i well i agree and i disagree i think okay. we're here now because of skepticism but i think that skepticism has existed for good reason for a long time. I mean, yeah. you go back several years, uh, Uber's breach involved some deception oh, on the corporate yeah. part, which is kind of an understatement. And um, and if we sort of expand that beyond cybersecurity, I mean, have, have companies ever shown to be completely 100% trustworthy? No, but it's it's our job to always be asking that. So I don't, fault someone for for necessarily being less cynical right but, right um but maybe the distrust is a lot more naked now because some really big companies have been caught red-handed in in just very public ways i don't know yeah no it's a great point i think i think especially recent history has informed a lot of our perspective on this, you know, not just as journalists, but as people who, I know we, we've just, we consume news too, you and I, I'm sure all 
everybody in the infosec space reads about this stuff and reads reactions. I'll, I'll tell you one thing I, I want to highlight as well is, and I've had some discussions with folks about this, the, the fact that Hudson Rock, when they put out that tweet saying, you know, we, we basically, they sent us a legal threat and we, we took the blog post down. Mm -hmm. um, and the reaction to that was, was very anti-Snowflake. Like very, um, and listen, I don't want anybody to get, I've received legal demands. I've seen, I've gotten legal threats as a journalist. Like I don't want, I, I don't care for them, obviously. I'm not advocating for them. Um, but I was, I guess, a little taken aback by how, how sort of anti-Snowflake the sentiment was from a lot of folks. Because I guess I just, like I said, I put a lot of stock in the joint statement with CrowdStrike and Mandiant. And I thought those companies aren't going to put their reputations on the line just to carry water for Snowflake. Um, and it seemed to me that they were probably right. And the Hudson Rock report was probably wrong. And if that's the case, and you ask Hudson Rock to correct the record, and they don't do it or whatever, I don't know. Like, are you really going to be surprised? Like, if we had written that Hudson Rock report, if we had talked with the threat actor on Telegram and published that, I would fully expect to get a letter from Snowflake saying that's not what happened. And we have, you know, we've already made a statement refuting this and so on and so forth. Again, I'm not, I, I wish they hadn't, if they did, in fact, make a, a legal demand, I, I wish they hadn't um, made, a, made a, a threat to Hudson Rock. Again, don't know for sure that that is the way it went down. Um, but I guess I don't, I, my point is I don't blame them for being upset. Th this, this, again, this report, this Hudson Rock report spread like wildfire. Everyone was saying that Snowflake was breached. And if you're the company and you know you weren't breached, or at least you're very, very confident that you weren't breached. Again, people harping on the, there's no evidence that blank happened. I get it. We're very cynical about that. Very skeptical of, of that sort of lawyerly language. But if if you're sure, basically, that that did not happen, and you've got a report out there that is just building a narrative that you're at fault and that, that hundreds, maybe even thousands of customers have been compromised because of you, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess, like, yeah, I'd want that blog post taken down too. I'd, I'd ask Hudson Rock to, to please take it down. Um, or at least I understand the sentiment. Maybe I might go about it in a different way, maybe a more tactful way. Um, but I, I guess like I wasn't surprised that they demanded that, especially with their user conference this week. Um, not that that should give them a pass on it, like if, whether the, they made a legal threat or not. But I certainly, it didn't surprise me that they did it. I mean, I don't know what you're left to do. Pretty please take it down. The, look at the look at, look at Look at this statement, not this, you know, bombshell report that's been covered by every outlet. I, I don't, I don't know. Well, the, the boring answer here is legal action from a company is always unpopular. No, like, I, it, just, sure. it just it always be. is. Yeah. Um, if you go to like the video game space, Nintendo catches a, a lot of flack. Yes. I think this was during COVID because they shut down Super Smash Brothers tournaments, which were using modded copies of the game oh. for for pay uh, tournaments, which Nintendo was also probably not, obviously not seeing any money from. And then they had to shut it down to protect their IP. I yeah. think Nintendo does plenty of sketchy things, but what I'm saying is at a certain point, a company's got to do what a company's got to do. It doesn't surprise me that it's unpopular. That's not a uh, an approval or condemnation, but it's like this sort of thing, I guess, always happens is my yeah. observation. Yeah. I don't know. Legal action is, is unpopular, <laughs> usually. Yeah. And, and I, I listen, I think there are aspects of this situation where you could you can you can credibly sort of put snowflake under the microscope uh, microscope and kind of ask you know should they have been doing more to protect customers from themselves you know i go back to the shared responsibility model i mean it, like it's kind of up to the customer to have mfa enabled and 
you know, a, a vendor can mandate it or set it to default. And sometimes that annoys customers. So you run that risk. But, you know, I know that Snowflake, they, they offer, I believe they offer Duo. You know, there's some people pointing out that it's not easy to implement. That may be part of the reason the customers didn't have it widely adopted. I, I don't know for sure. I, I'm not in a position to know that. But if that's the case, then maybe there is some some criticism there that that lands on on Snowflake. But yeah, for now, I, it's this has just been a weird quagmire where it's really it's really put in view, put at center stage sort of how we look at companies that suffer a cybersecurity incident where it's a, whether it's a full-blown breach of their environment or whether it's people just, you know, password spraying or brute forcing or using compromised credentials to get into customer accounts. It's really put it at center stage uh, in terms of what we, like what our reactions to, to those incidents are and the statements mm -hmm. that the companies make and how they make those statements and how we treat them with a level of skepticism and a level of, of cynicism mm -hmm. compared to our sort of assessments and, and views on, on threat actor claims. Again, not saying we take the threat actor claims more seriously than, cause I know most people don't, but it strikes an interesting balance and it's really, it's put snowflake in a really tough position. Uh, and I don't know where they go from here, but as you said, Alex, it, tomorrow we could wake up. We got to, I know I got to edit this file fast. We got to get this story up um, before yeah. anything big changes because things could change fast. So mm -hmm. um, the, if you want something optimistic to sort of close on here, sure. perhaps this, the skepticism against snowflake and against everything here Perhaps the positive takeaway is it might suggest slightly improved uh, media literacy on the part of social media and the infosec community that that folks are realizing, hey, maybe we shouldn't trust companies all the time. Maybe maybe they'll earn that trust back and we won't be as cynical or at least in the case of some companies that'll happen. But but in the meantime, like. Yeah, maybe maybe it's good we don't trust yeah. financially motivated entities. I don't know. That's, That's true. Lawyers are always getting in the way. Yeah, but anyway. Well, I, I think we can end there and we'll see where the story goes. Um, I'm sure we're going to get more updates. Sure. Uh, maybe not big ones, but we'll see. Uh, but Alex, thank you for joining me on this discussion and for recapping all of the the ups and downs of the uh, Snowflake uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Not a breach, not a, not a, the snowflake mess, the mess. snowflake mess. There we go. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. And thank you to the readers and listeners of tech target and the risk and repeat podcast. I'm Rob Wright, and we'll see you next time.